Hi, everybody. We made it. Time is flying by, flying by uh, this year in general. We're already at the end of our um, conversation series. This is our last one. So if you are joining live, thank you so much for joining. My name is Kristen Feemster. I am a licensed therapist and personal trainer based out of the Charlotte, North Carolina area. So if you're new to um, the group or joining me on Zoom, um, I want to welcome you. Um, feel free to ask me any questions that you may have. We've been having a great conversation so far about um, a lot of things related to creating change, um, specifically physical health um, and well-being. Um, but really, we've been pulling and, and figuring out that really it's all connected. And so our first talk was about diet culture. Um, our second talk was about body image. And then our third talk was about our relationships with food. And so now, <laughs> now that we have everything um, figured out on that end, now we can actually start about creating the changes that you all want to see. So thank you all so much for your questions. I have some questions I'm going to get to as well. And then um, we can definitely answer any questions you guys may have live um, and get started. So the Conversations with Kristen series. I'm going to give a brief synopsis of everything, a brief summary of everything, um, so that you guys, um, if you're new, you can understand where we're headed with this. And then we're going to dive in. We're going to dive into goal setting, improving your habits, like what does it really take to improve your habits. And so um, stay tuned for the rest of that. Uh, week one, we talked about diet culture. We talked about how sometimes our lens that we see ourselves and what needs to change through can be skewed by diet culture. Diet culture essentially says that if you were smaller, uh, fitter, eating less, doing uh, less of anything, it's just going to be better than larger bodies, um, not being as fit or whatever the case may be, that those are things that are to be strived against and that being smaller and fitter is something that you should strive for, okay? And this is all related to worth and self-esteem and that sort of thing as well. Then we went into body image because what we just heard from diet culture, right, leads right in. Hi, thanks for joining y'all. Thanks for joining live. Uh, leads right into body image. So with body image, we just talked about all the different ways that we um, form our body image and then also some of the stigma that comes comes with being in a larger body being in a smaller body just all of the standards that we are faced with to figure out and how to um, improve your own body image okay and then the last talk will the third talk that we did last week was around a relationship with food what are the origins of that most of us our food our relationship with food um, originated in our childhood okay so we're thinking what were the dynamics of my family what were the conversations around food how were we allowed to get food or not um, comments that were made did you observe other people on diets were you criticized for your body size what is was it a focus to be a certain size um, or to eat or to not eat did you even observe an eating disorder or have one yourself in childhood and how was that handled so we went into all of that and we talked about some solutions for your food relationship so if you haven't seen those talks those are all available to you by replay um, and so if you're signed up you've gotten those through replays so today we are talking about let me get close to the camera we are talking about uh, improving your relation improving your habits excuse me hey there on zoom um, and so I get a lot of questions about this but as you guys can see it's really a process right a process to getting to this point where you're now able to set realistic goals for yourself, ones that you can stick to long term. So, first thing I want to say is that um, when it comes to goal setting, um, one of the specific things that I like to make sure that my clients are doing is following the SMART goals format. And so, if you're not familiar with that, I'll um, do an overview of that really quickly. SMART goals is an acronym, and so S is for specific. M is for measurable, A is for attainable, R is for relevant, and T is for time bound. So anytime you're setting a goal to improve your habits, daily, weekly, whatever the case may be, you always wanna make sure that you're going through that acronym 
Is my goal specific enough? Do I have a way of measuring it? Is it something that's attainable, realistic for me to achieve in a certain amount of time? Is it even relevant to what I'm trying to do? Okay, a lot of times people come in and they'll have a weight loss goal that is relevant to their like physical health. And what we talked about last week was that it's not necessarily directly a correlation between larger bodies, meaning that you are unhealthy and smaller bodies, meaning that you are healthy. You know what I mean? And so having a weight loss goal may not even yield the results um, for your physical health like you think it will. And so that's another thing to kind of be uh, mindful of. And then the last thing is T for time bound. So um, I know how it is. You set goals for the new year, you set goals for the month and you're like, you know, this month I want to do this or you have a, a goal of um, exercising for whatever amount of time. And so it's very important that you give yourself a timeline for when do I expect that I'm going to meet this goal. That doesn't mean that you can't change and adjust things as you go, but it's about giving yourself a timeline, a realistic timeline that you can follow and know whether you're on track or not, okay? And so, but out of those five, out of those five acronyms, the primary um, ones that I find most of the issues with is goals not being specific enough, okay or not having a way of measuring whether and well actually all of them all of them are important um but both specific and measurable but i'll also say um are your goals realistic so let's hang out with the realistic part okay when you are motivated to start something new just know that there's going to be a lot of natural energy and motivation and adrenaline and excitement about whatever goals you're about to set okay but just like any phase of anything, that's the honeymoon phase, okay? And so a lot of times we will set goals based on our energy level at the beginning. Like, I'm going to work out five days a week. I'm going to meal prep every Sunday. I'm going to read in my devotional for 30 minutes every day. I'm going to be in bed by nine. I'm going to cut back on my social media. And I'm going to, I mean, and the list goes on and on and on because that's the energy that we feel, right? We're super excited about it. We really want, we're sick and tired of whatever we've been doing. And so we really, really want these goals to, to work out and we want to do it all at one time. And so making things realistic, oftentimes when I'm with my clients, I have to kind of pull them back in a loving and gent gentle way. I have to pull them back from um, high high expectations as far as their goals are concerned and so if anyone is setting a goal for five almost every day of exercise for example most times i will pull them back to three and why do i do that i do that because i'm thinking long term realistically speaking what is going to be achievable so if we have a timeline for the next three months and we say that you're going to work out five days a week for the next three months now we're getting into a realm where is that realistic is that realistic that you can commit to that lifestyle coming from potentially not working out at all to working out five days a week for three months straight and then also have a plan to continue it after the three months for most of us that's a steep start okay and so pulling that back down to three is not just thinking about the week ahead it's thinking about the longevity of that goal over time because once you get to the three months you're going to want to continue week uh, month four and five and six and seven but if you've completely burned yourself out going five days a week in an unrealistic way chances are it's there's a high likelihood that you will eventually burn out and drop off from that and so i really like to hone in on what is truly realistic for you let's think about it okay so we're in a pandemic right now <laughs> Um, we're working from home right now. Uh, the gyms are iffy right now. And I'm speaking about this as far as working out. But, you know, we could use any type of goal that you guys might have. Um, we are stressed. A lot of us, mental health, you know, is a focus right now and making sure that's taken care of. Um, potentially, you have financial stressors right now. Um, and all kinds of things that could really be on your plate. And so when you pile on this lofty goal, <laughs> whatever it may be, an extreme diet, an extreme workout regimen, um, uh, an over-the-top commitment to something that you haven't been 
doing already, that's just adding stress to your to your plate, right? That's not necessarily moving you forward. If anything else, if nothing else, it's weighing you down. And so when we make those things, when we make those goals realistic, and we say, okay, let's shoot for three days a week of 30 minutes to an hour of, of exercise. The idea is that we can always build upon that, but setting the bar so high is gonna then factor in with your consistency and potentially your um, feeling discouraged about whether you're gonna actually be able to hold to your goal. So I like to highlight those couple because those tend to be, um, they're all really intertwined, but those tend to be the ones that float to the top as far as common issues that people have in in goal setting okay and so the next thing that i want to um, talk about in this conversation is some other common obstacles that i just want to and feel free to chime in um, with comments or questions or whatever you may have as, as i go through this but i have three common obstacles that people face when in, when trying to improve their habits and become more consistent okay so once you have the goal set and the goal is realistic and the goal is, um, well, what you perceive to be realistic and you have all of that lined out. It's measurable, specific, um, time bound, all of that good stuff. One thing that often comes up is not really knowing your stage of change. Okay. Does anybody chime in on the chat? Does anybody know what I mean by what is your stage of change? Does anybody know what I mean by that? Generally speaking, when you're talking about your stage of change, it's about your readiness to actually do what your mind says that you're ready to do, okay? We all have desires, we all have things that we want to do, but you have to understand, okay, I'm gonna share. Yeah, you have to understand your stage of change. So I'm gonna go over your stage of, stages of change really quickly, um, but if you need more information on this, we can definitely talk about how to learn more about this and, and help yourself along. But there are five stages to the stages of change, okay? We have, we have pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation means you're not even, okay, pre-contemplative people are not even on this live, okay? <laughs> so they have no desire to change, no awareness about needing to change. They're not even considering changing. That's pre-contemplation, okay? They're just not, whether it's denial or no interest, whatever it may be, that is the first stage of change. So if you've made it to this live um, discussion, then we can rest assured that you're not in the pre-contemplative stage. The next stage is contemplative. Contemplative is when you know there's something that you could work on but you're not really sure you're more or less on the fence okay so on the one hand i want to stop smoking but on the other hand it helps me with my stress i'm i depend on it i'm not really sure you know i'm going back and forth on one hand i want to you know start cooking more from home but on the other hand it's going to take a lot of time and i'm just not really sure so that's contemplative is just being on the fence and not really committing to any certain um, action. The next stage is preparation. Preparation means that, okay, I'm aware that there's something that I want to change. And I'm also um, preparing myself to change. Now, again, guys, this is all before you actually do anything. Okay. Preparation is getting on this live soaking up all of the information that you can soap up soap up um inquiring about different services going around and seeing what different um uh gyms or other things could look like and making that just just for more information okay this could be um following different people on social media platforms that are talking about things that you're kind of interested in but you're not really sure you're preparing yourself right like it's like a posture of I'm getting ready to, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting myself set to be able to um, take action. And the next stage would be taking action. Action means I've got my goals, I've got my structures in place, I've got the information that I need, I've got you know the motivation that I have, the capacity to have at this point, I'm ready to go. That means that I am in the motion of carrying out what it is that I want to see. So if I have a goal for, um, you know, moving more, I'm plugged in. 
I'm plugged in, I'm moving more, I've got my accountability in place, and all I need to do is focus on staying consistent. And so if that, for, for some of you that are on this live actually, who work with me personally, that's where you guys would be. Um, any of you that are on here that are considering going ahead and taking that jump into working with someone or getting plugged in, you might still be in the preparation phase. And the preparation phase can go on for however long. Um, some people spend six months to a year to years in the preparation. Like I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready to do it. One of these days I'm going to do it. And then eventually, hopefully, we take some sort of action. Now, we talked about this, I think, I don't know, I think it must have been a post in the, in the Facebook group, but we talked about um, this idea of action and when does a habit actually become a lifestyle? So we've all heard it. Um, there's there's a, a myth that it takes 21 days to develop a new habit. Um, I read an article about that where it's like, not so true. <laughs> um, but um, I'll spare you guys the details of that. But um, definitely um, tread lightly if you think that it only takes 21 days to develop a new habit. There's so many other factors that go into whether we stick with something or not. And 21 days is a very short period of time. Okay. Um, then we have the 90 day rule. The 90 days, it takes 90 days to create a new habit. And though, eh, I mean, you're getting a little closer, but that's still not quite um, when you can kind of rest on your laurels and and um, become lax about what it is that you're trying to do. And really the maintenance stage, which is the next stage of change, is right around the six month mark, okay? So I say take the six month mark with a grain of salt because for me personally and everybody that I work with, I always say at least consider at least give yourself six months for sure but if you really want to be sure go a full year go a full year doing the same thing maybe adjusting your goals as you go you know you don't have to end start in and, and finish the year with the same goals but give it a good year okay go through all the seasons <laughs> all the holidays all the different changes in your work schedule and the things that life throws at you and then you can rest assured that you have created a lifestyle change. And so six months is where you're kind of in a maintenance stage where you might be able to not have as much accountability or you might be able to flex your schedule a little bit more. But really, when you're thinking about something becoming second nature to you, I say give it a year. Yeah, giving it a year. Again, and that that's, um, that's my personal experience or professional experience as well with working with people is to give whatever you're trying to do, especially if it's big, okay? Think about it. When people give up certain substances or do certain things, the year mark is a major marker in their ability to keep what they have. And so, yes, that means it's gotta be a total lifestyle change. You know, you've gotta, you gotta go through the summer. You got, for example, we gotta have to go through the winter of exercising when it's cold. What am I actually doing, you know what I mean, during the winter? But if I go from March to September and think that I have it, what happens when the seasons change, you know? And so, yeah, yeah, it's important to think about that. It, uh, Claudia says it's so true. Every season brings it, brings new challenges. That's absolutely right. Um, CM says, wow, one year, I can see that. That means it'll be a total lifestyle change. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, knowing your stage of change, listen, we all have our own process to changing certain things about us. You know what I mean? And so everyone's going to have their own journey. But you knowing where you are on that stage of change is going to save you a lot of time and a lot of um, discouragement around what you should and shouldn't be doing. If you're not ready, you're just not ready. But once you are ready, it's about having the, the tools and the supports in place to really take action and give yourself the best shot, okay? Feel free to chime in on Zoom if you guys have questions. I see you guys there. Hi. Uh, well, I don't see you, but I see your names. <laughs> Hello. Um, and so the, another obstacle that I wanted to mention, um, we kind of talked about it in the first point, was doing too much at once based on that initial motivation that you have. I wish, I wish that the same motivation that you have on day one of something would last until that one year mark. But let's be real, y'all. It doesn't last. It lasts. If you want to chime in in the chat, 
How long do you think, just for you, there's no, I don't have any statistic or anything. How long does that initial um, motivation that you have when starting a new goal, around how long does that last before it starts to wear off? I would love to hear from you guys with what you think on that. Um, but the idea is doing too much based on um, that initial energy can lead to burnout. And so it's like, man, I got to do this again. You mean I got to do this another week, another two weeks, six months, a year? Kristen, what are you talking about? <laughs> so you see how when you're like, wow, a whole year of the same thing? It's like, yes, that's what a lifestyle change is. Exactly. It's going to take that long. Um, CM says it takes me two weeks. Yes. So if I set my goals based off of that two week energy, what does six months look like? Jakia says it takes her three weeks. Exactly. So when we're setting goals based off of that energy and then we burn out on the second or third week, that's where we have to change the way we approach the goals that we set to really improve our habits. Okay. So thinking long term with your goals is going to be um, the most important thing to do from day one. What's my long term goal? Yes, I've got to break it down into measurable, specific you know, smaller steps, but what is my long-term goal? And I've got to uh, plan for that accordingly. Um, the last thing that I'll say about common obstacles is thinking that we can do it all by ourselves. And I'm guilty of that too. Um, sometimes we kind of grab some information here and grab some inf information there. And then we, you know, Google a few things and we look up uh, a grocery list and we look up a, a workout plan on Pinterest and then we do all these other things and really um, we try to do it all by ourselves and I don't know if you guys you could chime in and say why is it that we try to do things all by ourselves sometimes I think it's resources for it um, oftentimes I think it might just be our complex to think that we don't need help from anyone or that there's shame around needing help around things that other people seem to just do so so easily. Why do I need to, you know, invest in help or or sign up for something or do, you know, whatever it may be? Why do I have to do that when other people seem to do it with ease? And really, everybody has a starting place, okay? And so you don't want to um, measure your starting place based off of someone once they're past that one year mark and they're they've been doing this a while. Um, and have gone through those seasons already okay and so thinking that you should be able to do this all by yourself or that you can do it all by yourself um, is probably gonna pose as an obstacle at some point point. Um, and so that t the support or systems that you need in structure that you need in place looks different for everybody um, and so I would say as far as when you're creating when you're preparing and getting to that stage of preparation going into action that is something important to consider is what do I really need? Let me be honest with myself. What do I really need in order to make this stick? What I've done in the past has not worked because I'm finding myself here again. Now I've got to do something different. Okay. So I wanted to um, answer some questions. I have some questions. Let me check here what we've got. Um, let's see. Anita says, what do you say when you've gone through a program maintenance phase and then stop because, um, because want a change? How long should someone wait so they don't lose momentum risk of going back into pre-contemplative mode? Um, if you've already stopped, I would say, how long should you wait? You should not wait any longer if you've already stopped. And I want to make sure I'm reading that comment correctly. So maybe you could clarify there. But Vanita is asking, what do you do? Say you've gone through a program and you've gotten the support that you need. And, and then um, once, once you stop, you have, um, she's wondering how long should you wait and so that you don't lose the momentum. So what I would say is that perhaps um, completing that program, I don't know if there's more support that you can get. You know, what I usually do with my clients is that they start in a very um, structured and um, I don't want to say rigid, but it's very structured um, expectation of how what they're supposed to do. I'm on them. It's very specific. We're working on specific goals. And then as they progress in the program, there is no like drastic stop. There's a step down process. OK, so you go from this um, eight week jump start in my program 
And then you step down to the accountability tier where there's still check-ins for a long period of time. Um, and then once you feel comfortable with your intrinsic motivation to stay going, then we talk about stepping down to a lower tier. And so what I'd say to that is that perhaps that shift with the end of the program happened either too soon or too drastically is what I would say. Um, let me know if the, I hope that answered your question. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so I had a few questions I want to make sure I answer. Someone said, how can I find balance with drastically different aspects of my personality when it comes to developing good daily habits? For example, I'm either procrastinating or killing myself to accomplish everything in one day. I mean, yes. <laughs> read my life, read my life with that question. Um, but what I think is going on there is something that really catches a lot, is, a lot of us up, which is all or nothing thinking. Okay, going to the extremes. We're kind of talking about it as far as like that initial energy you have to set goals and you go, you go full-fledged ahead and then have no energy to maintain what you've achieved. Um, it's, excuse me, it sounds like that is what's coming up for that. And so if you have a tendency to do all or nothing type of moves, knowing that about yourself and pulling yourself into something that's a little bit more moderate is going to be the most helpful thing. And I would also suggest that having an external support to kind of catch you when you're in that mode, like, hey, you're doing that thing where you try to do all the things and Remember, you're trying to slow down and take it one day at a time, setting um, tangible goals for yourself. Sometimes that can be helpful as well to break that cycle, especially if you know this is like a, an ongoing thing that goes through all types of aspects of your life. If you know that about yourself, then um, I would say you've got to intentionally pull yourself back. Intentionally pull yourself back and um, give yourself permission to go slow and remember, sometimes the narrative around that can be that if I don't get it all done, then I'll never do it or, you know, that in general, you just have to. And so know that that's an irrational fear, okay, and that you can pull back and that it's actually going to serve you better to do it that way. Um, Brandy says, yep, all or nothing is like a perfectionist mentality, for sure. And so a lot of people who struggle with perfectionism or very high standards, high expectations, high performance, hardworking they tend to have a, an issue with procrastination as well, okay? And that's because it's like my standards are so freaking high that I put it off and I'll do it later. If I tell myself when I start working out that I'm going to go seven days a week for an hour, oh, I'm putting that off. Mm -mm. Oh, no, I'm not doing that. Not this week. <laughs> I'm not doing that this week. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's like, but if I know that about myself and I say, okay, I don't have to go to the extreme. I can start slow with walking three times a week for 20 minutes and then build from there. I can do that. I can do that today. That's something that I, that is realistic for me to take action on today and be consistent with. And so that's something that, um, takes work it definitely takes work to um find a find a healthy medium with that but it's possible um how can i best set realistic goals that can become healthy habits for the long term um i wanted to mention that one i think we've kind of generally talked about setting those those realistic goals but i think it's about again don't get in the game of comparison okay i can't tell you how many people have come to me and have told me how many times they think they should be doing something across the board that goes for my therapy clients and my personal training clients my coaching clients all alike they often come in with their own idea of what they should and shouldn't be doing how you know what compared to what they used to do compared to someone else's journey and you really have to be realistic about what is happening in my current life and what can I realistically commit to within those within that realm, okay? And so again, remember I listed all the things that we're collectively dealing with, you know, as a community and as a nation with the pandemic and, you know, all the political and social aspects of things that are going on right now. That is stress on your mind and your body. You cannot um, ignore that part. That doesn't mean that you put things off that are that are meant to take care of yourself, but you also have to realize 
that might change the way I go about setting goals for now. And that's okay. You know what I mean? And being okay with um, setting those realistic goals in your in your head, like for you personally being okay with, with the goals not looking like what you think they should look like is one of those things. So um, there was something else I wanted to say about um, setting realistic goals. Um, oh, the idea of being flexible. So uh, we're pretty much talking about this all or nothing situation, right? Where we either are all the way in and perhaps we have like this certain expectation for what things should look like. And I'll just tell you guys personally, um, this kind of happened with me with the pandemic. So those of you who have been in my group for a while um, or have known me before, um, I used to teach three, four group fitness classes a week. So waking up 6 a.m., um, teaching three days a week, sometimes on Saturdays. I was training people. I was seeing client therapy clients in person. I was coaching. I was working out for myself. I had a very active uh, life just by the nature of my profession and my personal interests. Okay. And so when the pandemic happened, um, I, I was offering, um, free workout classes in the group and I almost committed to, you guys may not know this. I almost committed to like three or four classes a week because everybody was like, you got to stay on you got to stay in shape. We're not going to let the pandemic get to us. We're going to do this and do that. And, you know, and there was a lot of stuff in the fitness community that was kind of like fueling that. But I almost committed to like teaching four times a week in this group um, or via Zoom for this group and then doing my own workouts. I didn't do that. <laughs> I decided on two days a week because I was like, that's what I can realistically commit to with everything else that was going on, um, that's what I could commit to. But I also struggled with um, realizing that the, not being in the gym anymore was gonna mean that my body was gonna change and that I wouldn't be able to run miles at a time because my muscles were changing and that sort of thing. I had a hard time being flexible with that at first. At first I was like, nope, I'm gonna keep my same routine. Nothing's gonna hold me back. I'm gonna do it. And I'm going to stay, you know, and I do enjoy working out, but I could see where that was kind of going into an all or nothing mindset. And so I actually experienced an injury because of this. Um, on my, my right knee gave me some trouble. I ended up going to the doctor, had to take a break. And at that point, I think that was around June, I decided um, here in this group that I was going to pause on teaching the classes. And that was when I allowed myself to be flexible with what my routine was gonna look like. And I hope this isn't boring, you guys. <laughs> but um, that was when I decided to be flexible more so with what my schedule was. Um, and it wasn't intentional what I was doing before, it was just I hadn't pivoted. I hadn't shifted gears to say, okay, if I'm gonna make this work through this year long now pandemic that we've been in, I have to do something different. And so that's what I would encourage you all to do is that once you get a routine that works for you, you have to be flexible with what it looks like. And so now I have not stepped into a gym in a year. Well, it's been 11 months, but it'll be a year next month, um, mid-March. And I had to adjust to working out from home, doing things in a different way, walking more, getting out and being in the sun and, and doing things in a different way in order to still maintain the habits that I know that keep me well, but also not to force it to look like something that it just isn't capable of looking like at this point. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to share that with you guys to let you all know that, that we all go through this. This is not something where I'm sitting up on live and I've got it all together and I'm just, you know, educating you guys to get over here with me. This is a convert. This is a journey for all of us. And, um, and you won't do this perfectly. I think we said that last time. You won't do this perfectly, but that's okay. Okay. And so I'm going to pause there. I shared a little bit of my, um, my experience with this, but I do want to pause and just see if there are any other questions before, um, I close out and for the night and we close up our last conversation with Kristen talk. I hope y'all enjoyed this. But are there any questions, you guys? Mm. 
Okay, I don't see any questions. I'm just gonna talk for a little bit longer and if, if I see something pop up, I will let you know. Uh, will you have more conversations next month? No, this is the this is the um, end of the conversations for um, for this. I just decided to do this honestly after the movement challenge. I felt like I wanted to have some conversations about some things that I just noticed within the challenge of people like going super hard every day or, you know, talking about the amount of weight that they lost and not really quite understanding, understandably so, not quite understanding why, um, why we were doing the movement challenge the way that we were. Um, and so, so many times I was like, Hey guys, I'm only asking for 10 minutes. It's okay. Like you're fine. <laughs> and it was like, I did 60. And it's like, okay, but what does that look like on day 21, day 25? Um, and so I felt like these conversations would help kind of bridge that gap. Um, yes, things do look differently in this season, but determined to keep moving in some way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, someone says I've put off any exercise because I felt like I would not be able to meet my expectations. Yeah. Yeah. And that is something to name and to know, um, for yourself, but also to, um, to make peace with and move forward with. And something that I, I like to talk about is that there are so many benefits of moving your body. And so sometimes it, though, whatever we have to do to make peace with the, the story that we've told ourselves or the narrative that we've been fed by diet culture or whatever it is, whatever barrier it is, it's worth it to work through it because moving your body, taking care of your muscles, keeping yourself strong, um, you know, even making changes to your eating habits, you know what I mean? All of those things are helpful, you guys. I hope I didn't make it seem like, you know, there's no use in doing any of it because it's all, no, there are benefits to these things. These things are medicinal for us. That is how you take care of yourself, but we've got to see past our own lens or even get a new lens so that we can really grasp and and experience the benefits of all of this stuff, okay? And so if we're stuck in the all or nothing, we're never gonna experience the benefits of what these things can actually do for us, okay? Um, I think that that is all the questions I see. I hope this is helpful to you. Um, I do want to share that I have, I'm going to be announcing or I am announcing now, have been kind of mentioning it. I'm going to be doing a launch of my program, Be Well. And Be Well is an eight week, um, educational in ways program that, um, that I have. It's been super successful for some folks that I've been working with over the last year during the pandemic. All of the Be Well clients, I can think I can say this, most of the Be Well clients, most of them, 80, 90% of them started their program during the pandemic and have found it extremely beneficial for bridging the gap and really being able to face some of these things and move through them, you know, to move on and get to a lifestyle that they can be proud of and that's not draining to them and that feels good to them. Um, the majority of my clients currently joined um, during the pandemic and I'm gonna be relaunching it. I'm super excited about it. Um, I've been doing some personal work and some professional work to make this program as beneficial as possible um, and have even added some things to um, provide more resource for those who join. And so it's an eight week program. It's gonna be starting in April, April 1st. I think April 1st is the first of the week. Um, anyway, the first week in April, it's going to be starting. I'm going to be, um, you know, doing some pre-enrollment, pre-launching stuff all of March. So these conversations that we've been having are really the essence of what Be Well is. And so if you're, if you've been joining and you feel like, gosh, I've got a hold of something good. I really want to, you know, apply some of these things and continue working on this. You know, the Be Well program is um, a way to continue this work. Okay. And so if that's something that is of interest to you, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be sending out more information to everyone to have, um, to have that. And if that is not where you're at right now, we just talked about stages of change. We just talked about how, you know, this program is going to move you forward into some steps of action. And it's also going to be a um, time where I'm going to be working with you to not go back. And so this is, this is the start of that long-term change that we're all hoping to see. And so just knowing that about what you would get 
from that program and knowing that though the jump start of it is the eight weeks, excuse me, the jump start is at eight weeks. Really, it's about what am I doing after that eight weeks is over to continue and to continue until I know for myself that I'm in a different place. My relationship with my body is in a healthy space. My, my relationship with food is in a healthy space. I've got a um, exercise, exercise movement routine that feels good to me. I'm no longer sub subscribing to diet culture in the ways that I was before. And I can say with confidence that my habits have changed. That's what this program is about. And so if that's something that is of interest to you, I'm going to be sending out more information. You can um, go to my website. I'll post the link um, underneath this video to um, get on the wait list and see if you, you know, just to have your name in the pool and, and make sure that you don't miss any updates on that. But that's going to be happening in April. And... Claudia says it's an incredible program. Oh, Claudia, I highly recommend it. Yes, yes. I hope Claudia doesn't mind me shouting her out, but Claudia is actually one of the women in um, that joined my Be Well program and has done amazing. I'm going to put you on blast. I don't know if, <laughs> if you want this or not, but she has really done amazing to stick with this program. I mean, it's really been, it's really been good to watch her um, since... I think uh, May-ish, April, um, and she's still going, still going, still working at it. It's not always, it's not always easy for any of us. You know what I mean? I still have my struggles, but it's about continuing to move forward. So, uh, I thank you all for joining. Thank you all for joining the series. I will have some resources and things, um, events and such um, in March, um, but this is the conclusion of our conversations with Kristen and I hope this has been beneficial it's been very helpful for me and I will see you guys later okay ask me questions please send me an email I'm interested in having a consult with you I will I certainly will I will get that information to you um, and we'll get connected soon so all right if there are no more questions I will say good night you all thank you so much have a good night bye